edited, produced. He's done it all. Um, he is also the possessor of a really great mustache. Uh, and I'm, of course, talking Takes about... Takes one to no one. <laughs> <laughs> I'm, of course, talking to the director of the WNUF Halloween special and other films. I'm talking with Chris LaMartina. And I also want to say to you, Chris, uh, before we get started, uh, you have a very special honor. This is the first interview uh, that we are recording with my blonde hair. Um, so if that's you're, a big if deal, yeah. So if you're watching live <laughs> right now, uh, chances are uh, my hair is going to be changing greatly throughout some of the interviews, depending on what order uh, they go in. So just don't be too alarmed. Don't adjust the settings on your TV. Everything is just fine. <laughs> um, I can tell by your shirt and by some of the um, decorations you have behind you. <laughs> that Halloween horror, all that sort of stuff you're a big fan of. So kind of what is your background with it? Yeah, so how I got into horror was um, from a very, very young age, right? So I grew up in the era of the uh, Ghostbusters, like animated TV show. It was one of the first shows that I really like watched religiously. Um, and then speaking of religion, I was um, uh, I spent a lot of time growing up with my godmother, my very superstitious Italian Catholic godmother. At a young age, like watching Ghostbusters and like old Hammer horror movies on Cinemax, um, you know, I, I started getting really attracted to the horror genre. And my aunt would actually, um, I would dictate scary stories. And like, I have all these stories from when I was like a young kid of, uh, they're like, mostly they're, they make no sense because they're written by a four or five year old and she just wrote them on the typewriter. But they're like non sequiturs. Like, it was a dark and stormy night. Like, the hand came out of the grave. It's just like me just reciting imagery that I had seen on like watching too much TV unsupervised as a kid. <laughs> milestones and what made me want to make movies right so um i mean i saw T toxic avenger when i was five years old and that probably ruined my <laughs> life or or made my life where it needed to go um mm -hmm. it was like i'd seen the toxic crusaders cartoon show and i was like oh they made like a live action toxic crusaders it's got to be like the live action ninja turtles right no obviously this is a much different like uh that was wild like when that kid gets his head uh run over it's it was mm -hmm. it was a, definitely a life-changing moment uh, you know, if something was any like illicit or or felt like I shouldn't be watching it, obviously as a kid, you're like, oh, hell yeah. If someone tells you not to do something, you're going to do it. Probably around 1993 or 1994, our cable channel locally in Baltimore got the Sci-Fi Channel. And they were showing a very, very severely edited version of Sam Raimi's Evil Dead. And I was like, what the hell is this movie? It's insane. And it looks so rough around the edges. This looks like something that I could do, which is, you know, it's a joke because like, of course not as, as a, how I was like nine or 10 years old when I watched this, there's no way you could make a movie that good. But I thought I compared to all the sort of like glossy Hollywood horror movies that I'd seen, like it done, it, it felt like just like this otherworldly entity. Going into it, was there any point where you were like, so once you got into filmmaking, you were like, I want to make horror movies and how did your like first movie come about because going off of your filmography uh your first listed film uh you mentioned americale but your first listed film is a film called faces of schlock so it's funny faces of schlock was in a um and that's one of those things where it's like i like like a buddy was making an anthology excuse me and i made it a segment and it's very very lo-fi like it was, it's like only 20 minutes so it's not really my feature it's like i just made a segment to it Basically, that process was me deciding, could I make a movie that I could sell to a distributor? Because at this point, um, it, like, like this is probably 2004 to 2005-ish. Um, to, uh, 2000, yeah, 2000, no, 2003 to 2005-ish. And then we sold it to a company called Brain Damage Films. Um, they, no advance. Uh, they sold a couple territories. I mean, one of the best moments of my life um, at the time was watching, there was, um, it got sold to Russia. And there was a version of a scene where my aunt, Mary Lou, that I talked about earlier, gets attacked by a werewolf and it was all dubbed in Russian and it blew my mind. It was like, oh my God, like someone took the time to take my crappy little $300 movie and dub it for a Russian uh, <laughs> film market. It was crazy. A lot of people I think would point how they were introduced to your films is the WNUF Halloween special. Mm -hmm. However, I was introduced to you through uh, your 2010 film, President's Day. <laughs> so I kind of want to ask, what was that like, you know, instead of an anthology film, you're making a full narrative, um, mm. three act structure, you're making a slasher movie. Yeah. Um, what was kind of the process of making that movie like? So I love slasher movies. My favorite slasher movie is probably Sleepaway Camp 2. I just think it has that sense of humor and just over the top, like everything you want in a, heart, in a slasher movie, like the very, like a killer, a very unique killer 
um, really gory creative kills, um, occasionally some nudity if, it, if it's appropriate <laughs> for the story, I should say. Because um, that's like the tenets of a, a solid slasher movie, or at least like an 80s style slasher movie. So the thing that made President's Day tough was a couple things. So one was we had originally written President's Day for my high school because my the, my principal at the time, I mean, I was 24 when we made it, but like my principal was so happy with the, with the local notoriety that I got making these horror films. She was like, oh yeah, you, you could totally shoot a movie here. So when it came time to like clear everything, she was like, oh no, 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 no. actually the school board needs you to sign off. They're not gonna <laughs> let you. And they had like, they had just, denied this athlete um this guy michael phelps who um who's an olympic swimmer he was he was denied to shoot a commercial at his local um uh high school so she's like there's no way they're gonna let if they deny him for it uh, like a like a gatorade gatorade ad or whatever they're not gonna let you shoot this gory horror movie i ended up writing a um the school's closed now so it's not a big deal i don't feel like bad talking about this but uh, we ended up um making a donation to the principal's fund, buying the school new exit lights. And like, we got it for a song, like super cheap. The whole budget of President's Day was $5,000. And um, the irony was the Archdiocese of Baltimore at the time, we had to, we wrote a fake script just in case they wanted to see the script. And the script was literally, it was probably the most boring thing you'll ever read in your life because we cut out all the murder, we cut out all the sex. So like people just disappear and the story just keeps going. So like the script we, we made, we, we sort of like, you know, bullshit our way through. It was like a 40 page script, which just like, you know, really funny. Um, but it was, it was one of the hottest summers on record at the time. I mean, now with climate change, every summer gets hotter. So we shot that um, July and August of, of 2009. And then it came, yeah, yeah. And then it came out in 2010. Or I mean, actually it didn't come out on DVD till 2012, but it was shown and we shot, shopped it around in 2010. I would say probably your biggest film. I don't know if you consider it your uh, biggest film, but it's, I know how a lot of people came to know mm -hmm. uh, the WNUF Halloween special. So we were coming up on a, a year, I think the first year it was, it was the first year we hadn't made a feature film in quite some time. And I was thinking like, man, it's, it breaks my heart that we're spending a summer not making a movie. And I was like, how could we make a movie fast? And I was thinking, well, the only way you can make a fast is to make a found footage movie, right? Like, because the other movies just take too much time to produce. And I was like, and the process of thinking about, and but at the most time, for the most part, I didn't like found footage films, right? Like, I thought they were kind of like, um, I literally wrote a list of like all the things I hated about found footage movies to try to figure out. And and this this is an important lesson. Like, mm -hmm. storytelling is the reversal of expectation, right? You want things to surprise you. That's good storytelling. So I often wrote the things that I hated down, like in in the context of like a story or or a, a type of movie. Movie to be like, okay, how do we flip that to make it fun or work for me? So I wrote, I wrote down all the things I hated about town footage movies. Like, okay, like one location, very few actors to keep costs low. That seems awful to me, right? Mm -hmm. Two, they're very monotonous because they're found footage, right? Mm -hmm. uh, th um, like three, they're, like the reason is, um, you know, why are, why are they filming this? So as I was thinking, I was like, okay, so why are they filming this? Well, maybe maybe they have to film this. Maybe they're being paid to film this. And then I was like, well, if it's this, if it's this, if it's one location or minor locations, okay, why are they there? Maybe it's a broadcast. Maybe it's like this TV thing. And subsequently, I was inspired by this thing. The Edgar Allan Poe House here in Baltimore. I've been hearing about this for years. Um, had had a live radio broadcast where they did a, a call-in seance, or not call-in seance, a, a radio on-air radio seance at the Edgar Allan Poe House. And I've always wanted to find a copy of it but I've never been able to find it. And that was always sort of percolating in the back of my head, like what happened on that radio show, right? At the Poe House, uh, but, I, but I don't know, it's lost of time. And I was thinking, I was like, okay, it could be something like that. And then I was like, oh man, because if they don't, if they stop filming, they lose advertising revenue. If they turn the broadcast off, they have to film because it's tied into the money and the sort of business side of film. Um, film. So then the other part I thought about that was really was the game changer, that truly was the game changer. I was like, holy dude, if it was a TV broadcast, it would have to have commercials and we could make all these fake commercials. Mm -hmm. And I was like, oh my God, my, my advertising background, like I could totally write a million commercials. Like, like this would be great. By when I was, I guess in my late teens, I was at a car convention. It was right around the time the ring was out and to promote the ring, they were, they had a cardboard box with blank VHS, like no label on these VHS tapes, just in a corner of this horror convention. Everyone was like, what the hell is this? You take one. And I got it. And it was the, it's like the first 30 seconds of the tape from the ring. So that always mm -hmm. stuck for me as a great viral marketing campaign. So when we finished the movie, you know, my, my then girlfriend, now wife, Melissa, like we, we drove around, we threw the VHS tapes out the window. Um, we uh, literally left them at like horror conventions and thrift stores, hoping like people would find the movie and be like, what the hell is this? And I think WNUF, it's a comedy, right? So like you mm -hmm. learn very, realize very quickly that it's um it's all kind of in good fun however 
what I will say is like, at that point, you're hopefully, you're smiling ear to ear and you're enjoying the experience as an immersive experience that you're not gonna go and take it out and be like, well, this is fake. You not only had to capture it with the commercials, but like you also had to capture it with um, the news element of the movie. And yeah. as you know, I'm a journalism major. Um, mm. I've seen a lot of news casts from like the 80s, 90s, stuff like that. Yeah. And they have a very distinct look. So like, yeah. was there any difficulty in like capturing that kind of, like making yeah. it really authentic? The problem with a lot of times when people spoof the 80s or, or any era, they do it in the sense that like, ha ha ha, look how much like, um, uh, how smarter we are than them or how dumb they were, right? And it doesn't come from this place of love or even realism. Um, it's, 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 almost, it's very self-aware. Um, and I think that's the issue that I tried to fight against with WF. Like I wanted to make it seem very era appropriate. There are plenty of times where like, I still wanted to feel like genuinely, like at least the aesthetic be genuine, right? So that was the most, most important. The tampon ad was shot on DSLR because um, that would have been shot on film. And obviously I'm not gonna shoot on film. I don't have that kind of money. Cause the whole, the whole WF is shot for like, I wanna say like $1,500-ish. Yeah, mm -hmm. it's pretty cheap, yeah. So another question regarding it. Uh, so I mainly want to ask about another mustached fellow. Um, Paul, uh, I feel like a lot of WNUF, why it works is um, your main actor, uh, Paul, I uh, hope I'm pronouncing Fair his last name. Fair Kampf. So what I'll, what I'll tell you about the the casting process. So when I um, I always joke about my actors like um, like I always joke about the movies like their summer camp, right? Like next summer, some of the kids might be back, some are not. But ultimately, they're my, they're my filmmaking family. And I started thinking about WNF, and I was like, you know what, Paul, the part I imagine for Paul would be this this really pissed off, bitter but very funny still, newscaster. And I wrote the entire part of Frank Stewart for him, like knowing that's gotta be Paul Ferencamp. It's just great. Largely, I mean, it was a full script, sincerely. It's, a, it's you know, start to end is full script. Some people did, were true to the dialogue more than others. Um, the gentleman who plays Father Matheson was 100% true to his dialogue. I don't think improv more than like a line or two. Um, the Burgers, Helen Mary Ball and Brian St. August, they improv a little bit, but not like, but like it's, it's sort of a healthy mix. Paul, I would say he remembered most of his monologues, but his interplay dialogue could be fast and loose sometimes. And it was really more about the go the whole thing with that was do it what makes you feel like your 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 character's voice. Like it's not like just add in jokes. I, I'm always very careful when people add in jokes because they get they have a tendency of like um, upstaging beats of the story sometimes. I mean, some people don't do that, but it, it, it's 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 just a, it's a tight rope to walk. But no, Paul is fabulous, and I mean I think. Um, uh, I mean, obviously, Paul takes direction very well, and he's and he understands the material. I mean, I think no none of the people that were like main characters in that movie tried to make it jokey, right? Like they tried to play it straight, and that was very important. What was the production of this latest one like compared to the first one? And just for those who haven't seen it, like myself, what can kind of be expected with this? I, I will try. I will try not to spoil anything because it's it's okay. a much different movie. The making of it, and I'll, I'll pivot back to the reason why, but the making of it was actually vastly different than the original because we made it during COVID. Uh, it was a really tough experience. We were Our biggest shoot was gonna be like a fake 1990s talk show, like a Jerry Springer, Rick and Lake, Ricky Lake, mm -hmm. and that was supposed to be Easter 2020. But obviously, as we all know, Easter 2020 was the like lockdown period of COVID. So mm -hmm. it was a ma massive bummer. Ultimately, what ended up happening was I like two years later, I was like, you know, I wonder if there's this the same type of nostalgia for the 80s that I feel could that exist for the 1990s. George Romero, uh, you know, made Night of the Living Dead. He made Dawn of the Dead. He made Day of the Dead. He made sort of like a zombie movie for three eras in a row, but very distinct to those eras. They're they're the statement he's trying to make, right? You know, 1960s. There's clearly some intense like Vietnam racial conflict that like that feels like bubbles up under the surface there. 1970s consumerism, all that stuff. Like it's it's really interesting when he taps into those eras. Now the luxury I had looking at the 1990s was, I'm you know th uh, 30 years removed, right? So, so it was like, okay, so let's look back at the 1990s. Like I looked back in the 80s and like, what was, you know, if we're looking at the 90s as a sequel to the 80s, what did that really mean? Like, and I think ultimately my idea about WNUF and what, what the sequel is really about is um, two things. One, how we dress up culture. Everything exists like thematically 
decade upon decade, but how that is dressed up in a certain era really changes. And I think, um, uh, you know, the 1990s in my head were really got more sensational and more cynical, but very over the top and like, um, and, and, and playing into that from a, from a sense of humor. It was a really fun experience, and honestly, I'm really happy with the sequel. I, I, I like the sequel. It's it's not... Uh, here's what I'll tell you about the sequel that's really important to know. It's a Halloween movie, but I don't know if it's a horror movie. There's okay. weird stuff to it, but mm -hmm. it's it's not like... It's not a haunted house film. It's not about ghosts. Um, when it comes to horror movies, mm -hmm. what is one that you will always recommend to, to people, whether it be they're big horror fans just looking for something new or maybe they're new to the genre maybe not like super big on horror movies not super familiar horror is a is a very wide lane yes. right so i kind of have to i and as someone who like devours horror movies and seen a ton of them i kind of gotta you gotta kind of pick your battles and say like who's this person why if somebody's like looking for like a truly just scary horror movie and, and like they, they want to see something that'll just like freak them out. The one of, of recent years that I've really recommended a lot is Autopsy of Jane Doe. I think if somebody is looking for um, something that's atmospheric and just powerful, the one that I think is an underseen gem, um, my, my wife and I both love this movie, uh, is The Devonsville Terror. The Devonsville Terror was um, a uh, uh, Uli Lamel movie from the early 80s. It's based, I, I think it's clearly the inspiration for Rob Zombie's Lords of Salem, but it's like light years better. Not to say Lords of Salem is bad, but it's more just like, mm -hmm. this is like, it's very clearly like some like through lines there. Devonsville Terror is really good. And then, I mean, I think it's probably my two uh, top, top recommendations. Um, 